over 40,000 eviction actions filed in Chicago at the Daly Center every year. There are just five courtrooms that have been set aside to hear these 40,000 cases. So each judge is responsible for 8,000 cases a year. And this is why, as Paul had mentioned, and as the Lewis <coughs> Better Housing Study pointed out, um, many of these trials last less than two minutes. And some of these trials can really be shocking. I have to say that I think um, the judges that we have now are more familiar with the rules and, and try to do a more thorough job and try to uh, protect um, the rights of each party better than some of the judges we've had in the past. Uh, when I was a young attorney many years ago, uh, I saw something that I really thought was shocking that was in a, and it was in a CHA case. Uh, the case was called Parties Approached the Bench. The tenant, of course, was unrepresented. The landlord had an attorney. And the judge said, uh, is there a termination notice in this case? And the CHA's attorney said, yes, it's a 10-day notice, Your Honor. I'm tendering a copy to the court. And the judge looked at it. And then he looked at the tenant, and he said, did you get this notice? And the tenant said, uh, yes, I received the notice. And so the judge then banged his gavel and said, uh, judgment for possession for a CHA, uh, stay enforcement 14 days. And the judge's theory seemed to be that if the tenant knew that CHA wanted to evict her, then she had to be evicted. No question about whether the alleged violation had actually occurred, whether the tenant had any kind of a defense. And this, this was routine. I mean, um, it was really shocking. As I say, I think it's a little better now. Uh, it, it's really terrible. The worst case I ever saw was one involving uh, a former colleague of mine. He was actually my co-supervisor. Uh, his name is David Harris, and he's now a judge down at 555 uh, West Harrison. But he had a client who was a quadriplegic, and he was stepping up on a motion. Uh, and he began um, by saying, well, Your Honor, as you know, my client, who was not present in court, my client uh, is a quadriplegic. And the judge said, client's quadriplegic? He said, off the record, I have a joke. And then he told a quadriplegic joke. And Dave was just shocked. Uh, but again, I'm just trying to give you a sense of how important it is to get some advocates in there to protect these very, very important uh, rights. Um, okay, so <laughs> he filed a... Um, if you do choose to file a jury demand, what will happen is the case will be transferred to the one jury courtroom, which is 1404, and it will be continued for one week. And then you'll have what's called an initial status uh, in 1404, uh, the week after the return date. And the judge will probably set a discovery schedule. There's an absolute right to discovery in forcible actions, um, similar to other civil actions. and. You should be aware that uh, the Forcible Act provides that no matters not germane to the distinctive purpose of the proceeding shall be introduced by joint or counterclaim or otherwise. So any affirmative defense or counterclaim you bring has to be germane, but there are many, many germane, uh, I'll get to you in just a second, uh, germane affirmative defenses and counterclaims, including, this is not an exhaustive list at all, uh, breach of the warranty of habitability, retaliation, uh, unlawful discrimination, uh, but there are many, many uh, that are germane. Sir, you had a question? Yeah, quick question about yeah. the jury demand date with uh, these cases. If you file it before the return date, I know the return date is basically the trial date. Yes. It's automatically going to be a transfer, so you don't have to show, do you still have to show up for that return date? You have to show up. You have to show up. Um, yeah, if you file a jury demand prior to that date? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because the judge has to be aware that you filed a jury demand. You've got to be the one to tell him. Unless you really trust the plaintiff's counsel to tell him. And, you know, and I often do. I'll often do that with Dan Starr, who's here, or Goldman, who's here. Um, you know, uh, never had them yet <laughs> uh, obtain a judgment against me after they knew that I filed a jury demand. Um, don't do it. Uh, <laughs> you say we won't do other things. That's right, that's right. Yeah, any, anything else is open. Um, just so you understand uh, what the process is, when the landlord files, backing up a little bit here, when the landlord files the forcible action, uh, the case will come up for trial on the return date two weeks later. Okay, so he files on February 2nd, case comes up on the return date February 16th, assuming that the sheriff can uh, serve 
the defendant um, before the return date. So if if uh, the tenant or the tenant's attorney does not file a jury demand, they're most, they most likely will go to trial on the return date. Um, if there's an attorney there for the defendant, the attorney you know, could say, look, I, I'm not filing a jury demand, but I'm still entitled to discovery, and the judge should uh, set a discovery schedule. Um, now, in the trial, these eviction actions are summary proceedings, but uh, there is a case called Echol versus McNeil in which the court said, finally, an eviction trial, like any other trial, should be an orderly procedure wherein the plaintiff presents evidence of possession and compliance with the necessary procedural steps for notice of termination, filing suit, and summons. So the plaintiff does bear his right to establishing, uh, I'm sorry, the plaintiff bears the burden of establishing his right to possession of the premises. And as in all other cases, he has to establish a prima facie case before the tenant has to say a word. Now in most cases, the plaintiff will have to present competent evidence that he actually owns the premises or is an agent of the owner, that the defendant has possession of the premises, is living there, that the defendant violated the rental agreement or is holding over after the agreement expired or has been notified of the termination of a periodic tenancy, like a week-to-week or month-to-month tenancy, that a termination notice was served, assuming one was required, and in almost all cases it will be, that the defendant owes rent, assuming this is a joint action and not just a single action for possession, and that the plaintiff filed suit in a proper and timely manner, in other words, not prematurely, not before the termination notice expired, and that the court has personal jurisdiction over the tenant because the servant, um, because the sheriff properly served uh, the defendant. Now, if the landlord establishes all these elements, at that time, the judge should turn to the tenant and say, well, do you have any defenses? If the landlord does not establish a prima facie case, obviously the case should be dismissed. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm doing the time. Ten minutes, okay. Then I'm not going to go over jury trials. Uh, But there is, this is just kind of a brief outline of what you should be aware of if you're going to uh, do a jury trial. Uh, how to prepare jury instructions, how to do motions and eliminate, how to do motions for a directed verdict, how to choose the jury, which is always very interesting. Uh, I do want to talk about common defenses. This is not, not, not an exhaustive list. And this list, again, I plagiarized for myself. I took this from the bench book. But you have to understand that the bench book was specifically designed to be a document that just set forth black letter law. It just Um, set forth legal principles that both the tenant's bar and the landlord's bar agreed upon. We were not in drafting the bench book trying to push the envelope or uh, uh, create an advantage for uh, tenants over landlords. Uh, And so there are many defenses that are not listed here uh, because when the landlord's bar got a chance to look at the bench book, they said, no, 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 we don't really agree that that's a valid defense. And so that's fine, so they're not in the bench book. But please understand that there are tons of defenses, and sometimes defenses you'll never have even thought of, like using um, the Fair Housing Act, as, as it did in the case uh, involving the victim of domestic violence, or using the Consumer Fraud Act on behalf of the woman who was facing eviction because she reported a crime in her unit. These are just the most basic, basic, obvious defenses. The bench book was written because uh, we had judges like the one who made the joke about the quadriplegics who had no idea what the law was. They just didn't take uh, these cases very seriously. They thought, what's the big deal in evicting somebody? So they get evicted out of one apartment. They can just go lease up another unit. Judges weren't even thinking about the residents of subsidized housing who, uh, after getting evicted for subsidized housing, are never going to get back in. So, again, these are just the most common defenses. Uh, 